Amen. Amen. Well, have you ever found yourself in a super dark place in your life? Super dark place in your life. If you're a human, odds are that you have been. A place of deep discouragement, depression, anxiety. Maybe it's due to a diagnosis of a disease. Maybe you find yourself in deep debt with no way out. Maybe you just made some dumb decisions. Anybody like me that you just can't get out of your own way at times? Am I the only one? Like, it's just, and, and as a result, you find yourself in this place of deep darkness, and some of us self-medicate with drugs, with drinking, with different things, and getting busy, workaholism, all these different things. And, and over time, sometimes we find ourselves in this position of deep darkness, isolation, chaos, and almost like you're backed into a corner and there's no way out. Anybody ever been there? I was thinking um, two illustrations came to mind when I was considering this position that I've been in. And one, we used to take the kids to North Carolina up in the mountains, and we'd go on these uh, cavern times where we'd go into these caves, and you know the guide would have a flashlight, but you'd get into the cave, and the dude would like turn the flashlight off. I mean, it was the worst. And, and you could put your hand in front of your face, and you, you couldn't see it. It was so pitch black dark. And I, I, I was reminded, like, that's the feeling. And the other, other thought I had was, anybody know what this is? It's like sleeping mask. I think, is that what it's called? Anybody have a sleeping mask? Raise your hand real quick. Like, if you don't have one, man. It's actually kind of dangerous right now to be putting this on. But I'm telling you, I ordered this off Amazon, man. And my, my wife likes to stay up a little bit later, keeps the light on. I'm kind of a lame-o. Where my lame at, you go to bed at like 9.30, and, and I'm like, yo, put the headphones in, babe. Stay up till three. Don't matter to me. I'm going to bed. I got this on. And it's, it's totally pitch black. I can't see anything. I love you, by the way. <laughs> Pro tip. This is the other picture, though. Complete darkness. And if I'm perfectly honest with you, I've been in this position a few times in my life. One of the times right before I came to Christ, this was it. This was the picture, this was literally a picture of me, and I've talked about it several times, but I have a distinct memory right before I came to Christ, and I'm in my apartment in Ames, Iowa. I had just gotten cut by the New York Jets. A dream, a lifetime dream had died and now I found myself in a bed of depression, thinking of suicide, dealing drugs, working for this amazing sandwich store. And I remember, I can picture it, man. I remember working to like three in the morning, sweeping, cleaning, and then I'd make myself this big gargantuan sandwich. I'd go home and I'd eat it half baked. And I, and I remember curling up, crying in a, in a pit of depression. Talk about dark. Someone say dark. This is, I couldn't see. Blinded, but at just the right time, how many can appreciate, maybe you're right with me, where in your darkest time, the light of Christ came and saved your soul, and now the scales that were on your eye dropped, and now you actually have light, you have peace, you have joy, you, there's a way out. You never thought in the million years that God could forgive you and set you free, but just at the right time where you were sitting in darkness, a great light shone. That's really Christmas. And for the sake of our time today, you know me, I'm a long-winded preacher. I'm gonna keep it real short. So I've only got one verse for y'all. You're like, hallelujah, this is great. I get out early from church today. It's Matthew chapter four, verse 16. And this was actually, Matthew's quoting the prophet Isaiah out of chapter nine, verse two. And here's what he says. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death, watch this, death cast its shadow, a light has shined. 
And when I was reading this verse, I couldn't get away from it. There was two things. There was two groups of people that I wanna, I wanna communicate with today. One is the person who's sitting in darkness. It's just like I was right there. I wasn't necessarily a bad dude. I just had bad habits. And I, if I'm perfectly honest with you, I loved Sin. I love the feeling of some of the stuff I did. I knew it wasn't God's best, but I loved it. So I sat in this situation and became darker and darker and darker until that day. And so I want to tell you guys, if that's you here today, no shame, no blame, I'm telling you the light has come and wants to illuminate your life and forgive you and give you peace and hope and joy, eternal life. Then there's another group of people that for whatever reason, there's, it's not because you're dumb decisions, there's something going on, there's a situation, there's a circumstance in your life, and now what has happened, it's like death has cast its shadow on you, and you almost feel just like depression, cursed, why God? There's a lot of unanswered questions, and you feel almost like this, under this weight, or under this, this darkness, and I, and I, and I came to bring good news, if that's you, even though your circumstance might not change, God can still illuminate and give you deep peace in your heart. So it's a two-part message. And let's start with this number one, this idea of, of sitting in darkness and then coming to the light. If you're a note taker, you can jot it down. Number one, sat to scene. <laughs> sat to scene, if I could see the first part of Matthew 4, 16, again, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. First, let me talk about the context. Again, this is Matthew quoting Isaiah, the prophet, who was talking many, many hundred, like a few hundred years ahead of the time when this, this area in the nation would be super dark before the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come. And I don't know if you knew this, but in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between Malachi and Matthew, there's actually 400 years of God being silent, of God basically going dark. It's almost as if I've been trying to get your attention through these prophets for so many years. You know what? I'm going to just let you kind of sit in the darkness for 400 years before John the Baptist ended up coming and talking about Jesus the Messiah was coming. It was a super dark place. At that time, the Jews were under Roman rule, and so they weren't free. They were taxed heavily, so economically it was dark, politically it was dark, spiritually super dark, and what, what needed to transpire? The God of the universe needed to come down on a rescue mission to light it up. I was thinking about that, how there's parallels between that time and then this time. Do you feel it? I don't know if you guys feel this. Do you feel the darkness at times? I, I was at an airport recently, a major airport in the United States recently, and I could just feel like the darkness. And the word that came to me was demonically divided. And it was so interesting because I remember I, we were in this airport. <laughs> it was so crazy. And you could just, I'm like just trying to smile at people. Because, you know, the poor TSA agent, you know, like, he, everybody's yelling at the guy. I'm gonna miss my flight. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm like, the dude didn't make the system that's broken. He's just trying to work here. Give this guy the benefit of the doubt. And he's like, people are yelling at him. And then, you know, he's yelling at them. And it's just chaos. And I'm like, guys, you're gonna miss your flight. I missed my flight. I'm still here. We're good. And I was just like trying, I was just looking at people. I just look, I just, there's a couple, it was funny, a couple that was just really upset. I'm like, yeah, man, it's a tough, tough deal, huh, bud? Like, we're just, I'm just like, can I just bring light to this dark and demonically divided place? And I'm like, you know what? We're not gonna settle for that. We're not gonna settle for the division. We're gonna have the light of the world come into this place. We're not gonna sit back anymore as Christians. We're gonna be like, no, let's bring love and joy and peace, light into this dark world. The world, when God created it, by the way, was full of light. It wasn't like the world we live in. Did you know that? A lot of times we blame God for all this stuff. When God created the world, he created man. He was hanging out with man. It was all good. And, and the light was shining. Everything was good. There was good connection. 
But because he had to create true love, he's like, hey, you can have whatever you want, but just stay away from that, that fruit right there. And we're like, which one was I not supposed to do? And what happened? Darkness entered the world. Brokenness entered the world. And now you have broken families and you have broken hearts and you have broken bank accounts and you have all this chaos happening. Why? It's us. Oftentimes I'll, I'll tell the church, grab your finger real quick, everybody, come on, just grab it. And there's, go, this is the problem. We like to point it, it's a TSA agent. He's ruining my day. Actually, nah, dude, it's me because I can't control my temper or I could get there a little bit earlier. Huh? Come on, somebody. <laughs> There's a condition, uh, this is true actually, it's called sad, speaking of like the sad, sadness, uh, and it's called the seasonal, let me get this right, affective disorder, S-A-D. And this is true, and what it is, is in the winter months, the days get shorter and there's not as much light, and so the light doesn't enter the eyes of the human body, so the serotonin levels dip and now we have people that are actually in depression. It's, the statistics are one out of every five people have it. That's why I go south in the wintertime. <laughs> Got to get that light in my eyes. I feel like, man, that's kind of the world where, like, we have a sad world, but it's not, it's not seasonal. It's spiritual affective disorder. And you know what? They, it's interesting. You know, they do say, the doctors, you know what they say? Like, if they diagnose you with sad, they say, man, go get some light. It's actually light therapy they recommend. Just wrap up in a Billy Rubin blanket or something or head south, one of the two. And I, I thought to myself, I'm like, you know what? That's what Christmas is. Christmas is light therapy when Jesus came into this dark place and lit it up. And now what happens? The, you, your, your eyes see the light and you're opened up and what you were dark and taken over from now open up and the light of the world changes it. Jesus said this in John 8, verse 12. This is what Jesus said. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So good. He will light it up. One of my favorite sit to see stories happened two, two Christmases ago, right at this church. And one of my good friends, and he had been making some really tough decisions and hurting his family. And, and really, it was a picture of, he's a good dude, good, hardworking guy. He was just, what was he? He was just he was walking in darkness, sitting in darkness. And his wife tells a story how she prayed for him for 15 years for the, for the, for the veil to be removed. And he was so close, she was so close to giving up. She's like, I was just about to throw in the towel my faith and believe in that anything could change. I continue, and just at the right time, two years ago, this man, when we were given this opportunity here in a little bit, he came, he humbled himself before God, and he was sitting in darkness. He saw the great light, and everything has changed in his life. He talks about how he sees the world differently now. He's got a different perspective, a different worldview that is completely changed his life. The sleeping mask is off. It's like the old um, hymn, Amazing Grace. I, I once was blind, but now I see. Maybe that's you here today. You're lacking vision. Or maybe your eyes were open before, but you've gone back to your darkness. Can I give you a good news? Jesus is not done with you yet. You're a prayer away. So number one, sat to see. Number two, shadow to shine. The second part of verse 16, I want you to see this. Those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light has shined. So you go from shadow to shine. Again, context. The area that they're talking about is Capernaum. And this area to the north there in Israel was they, they effectively termed it the area of death. And the reason was, if you've been reading with us, the people, the, the Assyrians came from the north to attack. The Babylonians came from the north. So this literally was like death alley. And I love it that Jesus goes right to the darkest place when he set up his shop for ministry. 
I love that. So this, this death, this chaos has cast a, shadow, cast a shadow. And I'm wondering today at church, maybe there is a death in the family or something you've walked through recently, a diagnosis, and you just feel a curse. You feel a shadow. Can I just tell you, maybe your circumstance won't change today, but I can tell you the light can shine even in the shadow. I've seen it time and time again. I remember one of the darkest times of my life as a kid and my parents had split up and I think it, it, there was a repetitive nightmare that I was going through. Can I just be honest with you at church today? I'm sorry to be Debbie Downer, but I just, I like to be real because some of you guys maybe are, are dealing with the demonic and division and crazy depression. So I'm just want to be honest with you, young guy. And I had, I, I had this repetitive nightmare every night for a while, one of the darkest times in my life. And it was like a shadow in my life. And the, the, the dream always happened where I, I was, something was happening and my parents were together, but then they were, they were leaving to go out on like a dinner date or something. And there was a babysitter or something that would be with us. And they'd, they'd go through the door. As soon as they would close the door, I heard this like laugh. It was like, oh, 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 oh. And as I heard this demonic laugh, I felt like a hand on my ankle and was starting to like draw me, like drag me down. And you talk about dark as a kid. And I don't know if it was the divorce or the Friday 13th Freddy Krueger movies, but something happened where I was in this dark place and it happened night after night after night. And I'm not sure what you're going through. Maybe it's not a repetitive nightmare, but maybe something's going on in your life. I talked to one of my relatives who has lung cancer and it was, it was crazy because in her darkest, deepest, toughest season of her life, I just got to talk with her this week and we got to pray and she said, I, I don't know what to tell you, Todd. Like, it's the toughest place I've ever been in, but I have the deepest peace in my heart knowing that the light of the world can shine in my heart even in the craziest circumstance. It's a true story. So I'm not sure where you're at. I have, I have a, another relative who got diagnosed with something just out of the blue, and there's deep disappointment through it. But I came to tell you, there can be a light that can shine in the shadow. He came. Light up the darkness. And so I, I, was, I was considering this for a long time, and I started thinking to myself, if Jesus came for all of us, not just a select few, he came for all of us, he came to save all of us, why do some of us still remain in darkness? Why do we still sit where we are at? and not let God shine through? I, I asked the question, and I'm just gonna give you a possibility today for us to consider, and this was this illustration, and you can jot it down if, for number three if you want, and I'm gonna preface this, so don't stone me, okay? Please don't stone me. Um, I want you to ask this question, how do I see the light? How do I see Jesus? You can jot it down, number three as a police person or as a physician. Now, again, I love all law enforcement officers. Please don't stone me. I know you're for everybody, okay? But I just remember in my days, I would be looking out for y'all, man, talking about, like, don't, don't, don't get me, right? So please, I love y'all. But do we look at it like he's out to get me, to, to put me in jail, or, am I, or is it a physician that's looking at me going, man, he's got some cancer I gotta cut out. I gotta get him on the, on the surgery table and I gotta get after it. And there's this picture, if you can pull it up, that I was thinking about the light and I was thinking about, anybody ever been through a surgery right here? No, three people? Great, y'all are healthy, it's great. So how many appreciate that they got this huge bright light that's, that's down on you and, and getting to the point where that physician can take the scalpel and like cut it out? You're grateful for that light. In fact, you'll go to that light. The other one, again, man, I love y'all, 
law enforcement officers, but sometimes, man, you come with the gun, talking about like, oh man, you know, it's like, and, that, and that's sometimes how I feel like that we look at, as a human race, we look at Jesus like he's trying to like, you know, incarcerate us. Can I just tell you, man, he came to give life. He came to free us. He came, yeah, he's gonna, man, you might have to get on his table. There might be some stuff in your life that's preventing you from experiencing God's best when he's chasing you down. When he, see, no, man, it's like, ah, oh, get on the table. <laughs> Can I give you a verse to back up my theology, please? <laughs> Anybody? John three sixteen. here it is. For God so hated the world, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son the greatest gift here. On, that's why we celebrate here at Christmas. Everyone who believes, everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And look at this, look at 17. We, we leave out 17 all the time. God sent his son into the world not to judge, but to what? But to Save. Oh, that's so good. That's, that's such, some of you, you've, you have stiff-armed God like me for years because you think he's out to get you. Can I tell you, he's out to get, he's, he's out to connect with you and do something on the table. I wanted to honor, speaking of which, there's, there's three guys I wanted to honor here today. And those of you who don't know, we started a ministry to help men coming out of addiction that have given their life to Christ and see Jesus as the great physician and they take four months to get on the operating table and let the Lord through like our directors go to, go to, go to work on them so we can show the picture of and just honor these guys. These, we launched these guys. We can give it up for them. Come on, man. Amazing. So good. And I was just thinking about like how often like through the four months they're like squirming off the table talking about ah. But they remained on the table and we got the privilege of launching them I talked with one of the wives of the men, sacrificed for the families of those four months. But she was just looking at me and just praising Jesus for the difference that the man is. He was on the table. He let the great physician go to work on it. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. The light is shining not to kill you and condemn you, but to give you life. We'll close with a story of a family who was in darkness and one of our good friends, she was struggling with alcoholism and drinking and masking some pain. And because of the grace of Jesus and her saying finally yes to the great physician, he began to do work. So check out this, this story and then we'll conclude. My life before um, giving my life to Jesus was literally surrounded around anxiety and when my next drink was going to be. How am I gonna get through the day without having a drink? 100% looking like you're okay on the outside when you're dying on the inside. That was me before, just functioning as best as I could while being a full-blown alcoholic and pro sinner. Yeah. This close to being fully in with Jesus but not kicking the one thing out of the way. So it was the morning of November 1st, and I knew that was the day I was going to be open about my alcoholism and my secret sin. I remember Justin was rushed, you had a busy day, and it didn't feel right to tell him. And I'm suffering pretty big time at this point because I'm going through withdrawals. And I was just praying uh, before I went to work that day, Lord, who, on, who do I tell? I need to get this off my chest. Um, so I was praying and the Lord just put on my heart, you need somebody with time. And so I see one of my bosses come in who I wasn't planning on seeing that day. Sure. Um, and I said, hey, what brings you down our way today? He said, you know, I just have some extra time today. It may not have been my husband, but can I just tell you, there was no better person mm -hmm. to tell because of the relationship that he has with my husband. Mm -hmm. I know the Lord picked that person that day. And I, it was absolute, just couldn't have stayed any longer. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I have an alcohol problem and I need help. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing you know, he's guiding me right to the Lord. 
you need to say yes to Jesus. And yeah. I was so already ready in yeah. there. I just had to get that off my chest. Yeah. And I can't tell you the weight yeah. that I instantly felt mm -hmm. when I said it. Just instant, like, you're going to be okay. Yeah. You're going to be okay. So I didn't even pack my own bag to go to rehab. Um, didn't really know what to bring, and yeah. COVID's still a thing. Um, so you packed my bag yeah. for me. I was worried about, you know, leaving my home and leaving uh, my husband and our dogs and just our family and what that life was going to look like. I don't know anybody at this facility. Um, it's it's ner you're nervous, um, but I did have that. I still had that sense of peace. Yeah. I did. The Lord just kept reminding me of, you don't need anything else right now, mm -hmm. except for me. You're gonna be okay. I'm not a like, be alone person. No. I'm very, uh, very much so like, we go with me, we go with me, we do this with me. I'm just not an alone person. So I really had time there and really got down, got on the floor. It was cold, nice cold floor and just got with the Lord. Mm -hmm because that is all I had. Yeah. And then as soon as I was out of my withdrawal stage, first person I called was yeah. Justin. It was just nice to hear his voice and know that we were starting over. Yeah. That there's light at the end of this. And I knew that. Mm -hmm. Even though I had a long journey ahead, I knew oh. that there was light. Yeah. I hate it that it always is like in the tough times you're reaching out to God, but like in that moment, I'm like, all right, Lord, hey, it's been a while. Um, hey, it's Justin, just so you remember me, you know. Um, Lord, just, I need your help. I need your help through this because I, I can't do it on my own. And um, that next morning I woke up, Wednesday morning, and I had this overwhelming sensation that I needed to go to Wednesday Bible study. And I'm like, I'm texting the guy. I'm like, hey, like, is this thing still on? Like, I, I, this is verb. I don't know if you remember me, but hey, I'm just checking to see if this is on. No response. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to show up. So I show up. I walk around to the front door. I was shaking. I was like, oh my gosh, like, I, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I know I'm supposed to be here. And I open that door and I, and I run into a guy I haven't seen in forever. And he open arms, hugs me and is like, verb, is that you? Sit down. You know, I didn't want to make it about me, but it ended up, everybody wanted to hear my story what happened you've been gone for three years what happened to you and it was from that point forward that I realized after sharing my story that day and leaving that I never was the man that God called me to be in my marriage the best thing for our family in the trials that we were dealing with was to be involved with church and be surrounded That's with the right. community of people that were there for us 100%. 100% and it was in those moments that that God began to re reveal to uh, to me particularly mm -hmm. why I was walking through what I was walking through in this season. Uh, Justin had told me on the phone like, hey, I'm making this decision for yep. our family. We're yep. going back to love. Yep. And I was so excited. So um, a little nervous, just, you know, hoping um, no one would think differently of us, but it was 100% the same as it always was and no one treated me yeah. or justin any differently the fruit that the yeah. lord has poured out and the favor over our life and our marriage mm -hmm. and with levi we have a son um who I, I wouldn't have gotten pregnant with i know if i hadn't given up alcohol mm -hmm. and my secret sin mm -hmm. what was once so uncomfortable for me because of my all that secret dark sin it is now the most comforting place yeah. for our family. It's home. It's home. I look at sin so much differently now. Like I take it so much more seriously because I know I know what it's like being on the other side. Like I have peace now that surpasses all understanding because I'm firmly planted by the river uh, and getting the, nu the nutrition from the Lord versus trying to do life on my own. By me saying I'm done, and I surrender it to you. I'm all in with you, Lord. Um, I want you and more of you. Our marriage has grown yeah. tremendously. And just my relationship with the Father, um, as it's still in process, it's just, it grows every day. Yeah. What I would want to say, if you're feeling um, anything like where I was at, um, 
maybe close to it or really far from it. Lean into what's uncomfortable mm -hmm. because God's working there. I can't say it any any better. Just say yes to whatever it is that he's calling you into because it's going to pay off and you're going to find fruit in it and you're going to be living your best life because that's what God wants for you. We are Justin and Angie Verbeck and this is our More to Life story. Man, that gets me every time. thinking of the verbs, it's great friends of ours. And what's interesting about this couple is they're, they're here every Sunday morning and they got the biggest smiles on their face. And you could just see the light flying out of them. And I'm just picturing, like, this is, this is where she was. Dark, it was a dark, it was a dark place. If you ever struggled with addiction like I have, it's a dark place, man. You feel like there's no hope. And I'm so grateful for them sharing their story because there's some of you that are thinking the same thing. You're lacking hope. Can I just tell you, on this Christmas Eve, there's hope. And his name is Jesus, the light of the world. Though you might be sitting in the darkness, you will see a great light and you'll see greater days. So let's stand together and I wanna provide an opportunity for response in here today on Christmas Eve. It's, it's very possible you're working through a dark season and you were invited by a friend, a family member to come to this place. You didn't know what to expect. In fact, you were like, I don't know if I'm really gonna show up. But can I just tell you, you're, you're not here by mistake. God sovereignly planned this out for you. He loves you so much. He put all this together. He's trying to reach you. He's not trying to beat you up. He's not trying to incarcerate you. He's trying to liberate you. And if you'll just give him a chance, I promise you, your life will be forever changed. So in a moment, the band's gonna play a song. There's gonna be a lot of Christians here praying for you. And here's what we're really praying. It's literally what we're praying. We're praying that the veil would drop. Darkness to light no longer in bondage, no longer thinking God's out to get me, but give your life to him and see what he'll do. God's perfect, he's holy. All of us have blown it. We don't get to heaven by our good works, we get to heaven because of what Jesus did on that cross. He lived the perfect life you couldn't. He died the death in our place and now he's simply saying, man, just come. They buried him three days later. He rose from the grave, proving who he is. He sends his spirit out now. He said, just come to me. Turn from your sin. Follow me. I'll lead you in life, a life filled with light, with hope. Will it be tough? Absolutely, because we're on this planet. But he'll give you peace in the circumstance. I've said enough. I'm just going to pray for you. Church, just begin to pray. God's speaking to you. You come forward right here. I'll lead you in a prayer a prayer of repentance, a prayer of salvation. It'll be your day one, true light. So begin to pray, man, go ahead and play. You come, you come now.